It's very nice to be here this evening and be allowed to tell you something about the thing, two things that interest me very much. Because I'm not only interested in genetics, I'm also interested in history. And there are several different ways that we can find out about history. Uh, there are different types of historical documents. It can be things that we find that people have left behind. It can be written sources that are written either in, in old books or written on walls of pyramids, as you can see here. Or it can be drawings or it can be photographs. And all these historical documents, they tell us stories, stories about how things were in the past. What I'm going to tell you about today is another source of historical information, and that is DNA. And the DNA occurs in all our cells, and in these cells the DNA is organized in chromosomes, and if we zoom in on the chromosomes, we'll find that it consists of different letters, A, G, C, and T. And the order of these letters uh, and the, the, vari the variations of how these letters are, are put together, they contain information about the evolutionary history of the specimen. So for example, if we have a population, as we have up here, as you can see it contains genetic variation, there are different variants here. And if this population experienced climate change, for example, over time, you will see that the, the differences in climate will select for new varieties of, of the DNA. And when we look at the genetic composition of this, pop of this population here, the DNA will actually tell us something about the natural selection that has acted upon it in the past. Now, the DNA can also tell us about, about migration patterns. So if we, for example, have a hypothetical example here of barley, and barley has originated here in, in, in Europe and been brought towards northern Fenoscandia, either through Norway here or through Finland, you can see that the genetic composition of the populations, they change as they migrate north. And if we were to study all of these populations, we could actually say something that, well, this population here in northern, northern Sweden is a hybrid population of seeds that have been brought from Norway and from Finland, for example, through trade. <clears throat> now, northern Fenoscandia is actually a very interesting um, region when it comes to, to cultivation in general and cultivation of barley in particular, because it is the northernmost region in the world where we can cultivate barley. And you can see here that historically it's actually been pretty tough to, to cultivate barley in these areas. You could survive on it, but not by much. So you can see this old lady here, she's out on the field and she's brought the sun along. So after the harvest, they go back out into the field and they collect by hand all the ears that have been dropped during the harvest because they cannot afford to waste anything that they can, will need to eat in the future. Now, the sensitivity of agriculture in this area was brought very close, was made very clear during the 19th century. Because in these years, there was a big famine in this region. And you can see on this graph here, it shows how much yield was given. So this is a yield ratio of two. And that means that for every barrel of seed that was sown that year, they could harvest two barrels of seed after the season. And you can see that not only was it a really, really poor harvest in 1867, it was actually not very good in other years either. And just to put this in, into perspective, this is yield ratio of two, this is yield ratio of four. A typical re yield ratio of Sweden today is about 28. This summer has been very dry, and you know it has been very bad for ag agriculture, the yield ratio of this summer is 22. It's quite different from what they had in the 19th century. And this led to, to, to a great famine, and lots of people migrated to America as a response to this famine. And you can see here is another historical document showing how the farmer the man out here is actually trying to gather bark from the tree so they can make bark bread for his family. And the son here is trying to eat his, the leather of his shoe because he hopes that it's at least going to contain something, while the mother and the younger siblings are dying from starvation. Now, the Swedish government didn't let, let this happen. It was actually almost nobody died of starvation as a result of this famine because there was seed relief. So the government sent... Uh, different kinds of, of famine relief and aid 
to the north northern regions that have been uh, been, been struck by this this uh, crop failure and, and and the famine. And here's another cartoon from from these days showing how things made about. And we do not really know what how the the this, uh, the famine relief was was given because some historical sources they write that it should be given as flour and preferably it should be mixed with lichen so it lasts a bit longer. But you can see here in these drawings that there's actually seeds that are given away. And this is a very critical drawing because it says, well, these people here, the ones that are wealthy, the ones that are forward, they actually manage to lay their hands on enough seed that it could actually sell on, even though there was famine. Whereas the poor farmer over here, he only got as much that he could feed himself or and his family, so they survived. Now, we were interested in what was really true. Was it that they were given flour or was it given seed? And if they could sell seed on, were these seeds then used for sowing? To answer this, we turned to a rather unique source of the material. Yeah, in, in, in the Nordic countries, there are several seed collections of seeds that were collected in the late 19th century, such as these. And from these seed collections, collections, we took seeds that were harvested during the famine years and also some decades later. We took these seeds into the lab, we extracted DNA, and we used the DNA to analyze the genetic composition of the seeds. Now what we found was that there were actually quite clear genetic differences between the, the barley that was grown in the region during the famine years and the barley that was grown after the famine. So you can see here that during the famine years, it was actually a genotype, the, the purple genotype here was quite common. But if we look at seeds that were harvested some three decades later, you can see that the purple genotype has become much, much rarer. And instead we have this turquoise genotype that has become much more common. So this can be interpreted as if um, the famine relief that was given was not just given as flour, but actually as seeds. And these seeds were to some extent sown and incorporated in the gene pool in northern Fennoscandia in these times. Now, one of the seed jars really intrigued us, and there was this one, as you can see here on the, on, on the right. And uh, this is a jar of seeds that were harvested in Kvikjok, a little village up in northern Sweden. And it was harvest, harvested in 1868. And we actually know what it looked like in Quick York because in 1868, the same year as these seeds were harvested, Lotte von Dieben was there and she took photographs. So this is the actual area where these seeds were harvested in the same year. And we also know something about what it was like to try and do agriculture in this region. Because we had um, a thesis that was written in, in the early eight, 19th century. And it tells us that, well, in June, uh, the ice, the June begins with the thaw of ice on lakes and, and rivers. And on the 10th of July, uh, the barley fields grow ears. So we know that within about a month's time, the farmers in Quick Yok, they had sown their seeds, they had grown them, and the seeds had started to set the ears and started to set seeds. So about a month was the, all the time they had to grow their, their livelihood. But they, they didn't do poor, too poorly, because we also can see here how well they did. So at Nord Stycket here, they sow, sowed two kappa, which is about nine liters of seed. And they were able to harvest two and a half shell, which is about 46 liters of seed. So they actually had a, a, a yield ratio of five. So for every liter they sowed, they could harvest five liters of seed. Now, when we looked at these seeds genetically, we found that they were really low diversity here in Kvikjok. But we surprisingly we found that the seeds in Pyla were equally non-diverse. And when we looked a bit closer, we found that this was caused by the fact that there were genetically identical seeds. And these genetically identical seeds, they were common here in Kvikjok, in Pyala, and in Karosonda, these black bars here. And why was this? In order to explain this, we have to turn to this man. This is Lars Levelistadius. Uh, he was the uncle of the man who donated the seeds from Kvikjok, call you, Johan Karlsson Lestadius, this man here. He donated these seeds. And Lars Levi, he grew up in Kvikjok. His uh, older half-brother was a vicar there, and he grew up in Kvikjok in the early 19th century. 
He was also the man who wrote this thesis about agriculture in, in the lap marks and how <coughs> agriculture occurred in Kvikjok. He's best known as being the founder of the Serbian Pietist Revival Movement and preaching to the Sami people about his faith. He was a vicar in Karesuandel, here, in 1826-1849. And in his final years, he was a vicar here in Payala. So for all these places where we have these common genotype, the identical seeds, we have a very strong connection to Las Levili studies. So what are the stories that are these dead seeds have told us? Well, they have told us that the famine leave relief was not only used as a source of food. And this statement that was written in this critical cartoon here, that the wealthy received enough seeds so they could actually sell it off, is probably not just empty words. There is some truth to it. And we also learned that lastly with his studies, he did not only spread his version of the, of the Christian faith in the region, but he had an influence on the agriculture as well. Thank you very much for listening.